Welcome to the People's Program, where the stories of our people and their communities are told by our people. I'm Sherwood McCaskey, it's my community. This week, we continue the celebration with the Garden Community and the Garden Church of God. In this episode, historian Morris Greenwich begins the 100th anniversary celebration by placing things in historical perspective. To do this, he calls attention to one of the island's earliest records. 1625, the year when Captain Henry Powell was on his way back to London from the area of Suriname and traveling through the, what we now call the Low Islands, um, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. That was the route that sailing ships took to get back to England from the Caribbean. They went west and then north up the coast of, of North America and the, the Gulf Stream on the time of the year, when they read between Virginia and Boston, the Gulf Stream turned right and took them. They could take their sails down and they'd sail back and they go back to London. Similarly, coming out to the Caribbean um, from either England or from the Azores, um, they normally came down on the swells and ended up, once they pointed in the right direction, first at Barbados. So that gives you a little bit of an overview. In 1625, Captain Henry Powell in the boat Olive Blossom is going back to London. And you know July? Stand by. Well, he got the time of his life because out of the blue, they came black. The skies changed and the winds howled, and he had to sail before the wind. Now, a couple of months ago, we got volcanic ash from St. Vincent. Does anybody know where it came from? My friend Mike Williams in St. Lucie called me about five o'clock, a couple of afternoons after the uh, eruption. He said, Morris, the ash coming. I said, how do you know? He said, it coming up from down in north. He is in St. Lucie, he's at Cove Bay. So this ash has left St. Vincent and gone past St. Lucia and come back to Barbados in a circular route. So if you can understand that, St. Lucie would have gotten the ash fall first. Now this, put your minds back to 1625 and this hurricane weather that this boat is going to experience. And when he is run before the wind, and this is what they call it. He ends up somewhere off the coast of St. Andrew, where he now sees Barbados for the first time. Of course, he's going to look at his charts and so on, decides where he is, and then uh, try to explore this new country for him. So he comes around the north, and he comes up the west coast. And the first navigable stream he finds is the whole, uh, whole town. Um, it is nothing like what it used to be uh, then. And so he names the place, I think it was Powell who named uh, the landfall, Jamestown. Remember that this is the second Jamestown because in 1607, um, another settlement called Jamestown had been started for the first time in the United States of America at a place called Plymouth, Massachusetts. Also, Jamestown gets the name. But what Mr. Powell did not know, obviously his internet was not working at the time, he did not know that King James had died. Because now we know that Jamestown, or St. Jamestown as it was called, is the only parish in Barbados that is not named for either a saint or a religious artifact. All of the other parishes, St. Lucy after Lucy of, uh, of Syracuse, St. George after uh, St. George, uh, the patron saint of England, St. Andrew after the patron saint of Scotland, um, all of the parishes except for Christ Church, of course, which is named after the Church of Christ. That's a religious artifact. But St. James or Jamestown is named after a man with huge feet of clay. He was a huge, huge 
failure in everything else but the fact that he was the king of both England and Scotland at the same time. Um, he was so dissident, in fact, that at age 58 he died. He gave up the ghost, literally refused to take medication. He was so sick. He said, I'm done with that. And so he lay, he, he lay down one evening and, and died at age 58 in what would have been the prime of life. So St. James gets its name and Cortine, when they come back in 1627 to settle, Cortine lays out his five plantations, five huge plantations. Cortine does not have a surveyor. What Cortine does is use the water courses as his points of reference. So the first plantation in St. James coming north would have started at the water course between the telephone exchange and the old coach house. Coming north and finishing at the rectory, the St. James rectory, which we remember that was a pretty large stream as well. The Devi Hotel covers some of it now. And then the, the next plantation starts at that rectory river and finishes at the hole. We would have called that, the first plantation of course would have been Sandy Lane, the second plantation is Lascelles Copers Hill. And then the third plantation is Trent's and Porter's combined and it was originally called the Fort Plantation. And that plantation came down to uh, a spot quite near to where um, Victor Bab and, and Yvonne lived at the end of the Miramar Wall. If you look up from there, you can see Mount Stampus at the top of the hill. Now, that, there was some mark there which we cannot yet find, it, but either have been a tree, a significant tree, or some other mark, or it may have been a water course that is a little bit obliterated. We'll talk about that later. Now, so after um, Powell, for their loyalty to Cortine, is given this plantation, this, and it's called the Powell's Plantation. You now call it Mount Stanford's, and you could probably say in those days it was Mount Stanford's Garden. But of course, you know that um, Barbados had its first civil war, 1628-29, the North, Cortine versus the South, Wolverstone and Rodden. And by the end of it, um, the Bridgetown faction had taken over Barbados. And so you had new people coming in, and they were dividing the spoils in the north, so that one plantation, like Sandy Lane, was suddenly divided into five or six. They were so, so large by Bridgetown standards. And so the Powell's plantation also had some divisions. And one of them is the fact that this place, which you now call the garden, was hived off. We don't know to whom or by whom. We suspect, however, that it's a Quaker, because there are certain names in Barbados that will tell you who were responsible for them. And when you hear names like the garden, the retreat, the hope well, content, names of that kind of relaxed religious nature, they're nearly always Quaker names. So the Quakers sometime in the early history must have had a little piece of the action. And let me tell you what the boundaries would have been. The boundaries appear to have been the water course directly south of Auburn Hines' house. Everybody knows what I'm talking about? Auburn Hines is on the opposite side of the road, 30 feet south of Husband's Gap, the entrance, opposite the Chase Boys, the, 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 the Rasta boy who, who sells plants and so on. That's Auburn Hines' house. And there's a water course, a significant water course. Somewhere, somewhere in the back of time, somebody has obliterated the, the gully or the whatever the course was uphill. Um, but that, is, that was the measurement from there to the creek at Neblitz and uh, Ezra Folder. The creek that separated the beards from Alicia Haynes' jokes. You know what I'm talking about now, right? So water courses were used as markers. And when I worked that out, it's about a 
or a couple of hundred acres. So the garden would have been a small plantation, which was hived off. And again, as I said to you, I think it may have been a Quaker. But we're going to come across the Quakers a little later on. The original boundaries, remember Hines and Beard Haines Creek. We are still trying to find out who bought those, um, that little plot, which may have been uh, in excess of 100 acres. Now, the, the Garden Church of God, your founders here, the people who, your treasurer or whomever, might find out. However, I think I know that you, you bought this plot of land from Uncle Reggie, who was our school bus driver. And Reggie was like a school teacher. He couldn't misbehave in his bus because he can get the same flogging as if he mis misbehaved in the classroom. Um, but I have a sneaky suspicion that the back side of this chapel is among Stanford's lands. But that would depend on the old deeds. You have to search and dig up the old deeds to find out if that is so. Well, let's take a look at the churches and the denominations. Of course, the first church is going to be the St. James Parish Church. And the English, wherever they went, put down a church and a pub. Wherever the Dutch went, they put down a brewery. We can't find the pubs in Old Town or St. James, um, but we can find the churches. We know that St. James Parish Church was in operation by 1628, possibly before then. But certainly by 1628, that church was in operation. And after that, they had religion for themselves until the Quakers arrived sometime um, in the 1640s. Very quickly after the Quaker movement, in fact the correct name being the Society of Friends, was founded in London by a man called Fox, the Quakers somehow managed to find themselves in Barbados, largely because they were worried about Cromwell. Now Cromwell was a anti-establishment. He had nothing at all to do with, with the Anglicans. Um, and so um, his own religious faction was non-conformist. And he did not do too well by the Quakers either. So they came out to Barbados. But as soon as the Cromwellians took over around 1650, they started to have their problems. Very early in the piece, Fox finds himself in Barbados. In fact, you will discover that Fox's mother-in-law was living in Kensington. I don't know if she was here before or if she was just here for a while, but his mother-in-law was here at Kensington and his wife may well have been a Barbadian. Now St. James Parish Church then ruled the roost um, and after the Quakers, then the Methodists came to St. James. The Methodists came to St. James, to Holton, and to Spitestown at the dawn of emancipation, just before the apprenticeship period, around 1833. By 1835, there were uh, chapels in Spitestown, in Holton, and certainly a chapel school at Payne's Bay. The building is still there. And then uh, Fort Clarendon, which is just next door to you. And I know Wilton is close to that. Fort Clarendon is now St. Albans. It was abandoned as a fort around 1830. And the Anglicans, I suspect, uh, in the competition with the Methodists turning up, decided to expand. And they moved into the officer's mess. And that became St. Albans. By, 1830, by 1840, uh, church was going on in St. Albans. But St. Albans was not consecrated as a chapel until 1863. That two, chap two forts at the same time um, were, were, were demilitarized. 
and used for secular purposes, or in fact, one religious and one secular. The other was the Barbados Battery at Black Rock, which has now become the archives in the Lazaretto. We come back to St. Albans. Um, very funny story about St. Albans. Funny, but not if you were around at the time. In 1854, we had the cholera epidemic, and Wilton's sister, Violet, um, confided in me not to let anybody know, so I'm not telling you her name, that when she was a girl, the larger boys, when the seas came up rough, would find the skeletons from the cholera burial well and run the girls, the little girls. And she remembered one particular skeleton that had gold teeth in the mouth. And there was this, this I think she called the boy's name, I, I can't remember, who had this huge, must have been a femur, for a leg bone, and chasing the girls around. Uh, but so that, that color of ground stretches from the, the edge of the north side of the, of the churchyard down to Motley's Bay House. It's a huge color of ground. St. John the Baptist um, Church was given by the Richards family, who were then the owners of Holder's Plantation, and that was consecrated in 1869. And St. Silas, by the Walcott family, which by then had become the largest of, uh, of the plantation owners in the parish. And they gave St. Silas in 1874 next to another cholera ground at what would have been Waterhall Plantation. And then around the turn of the century, around 1894, uh, the Good Shepherd was founded by St. John the Baptist as the Chapel of East of St. John the Baptist. And they, the, the lay reader um, was given the responsibility of preaching the sermon and also carrying on a small boys' school. Okay, and that went on until the 1970s when Good Shepherd Boys' School was built by government on top of the hill above Good Jordans. And then they built Stone Church, which is now the Good Shepherd, on another fort property. That fort was called Holders or Harris's Fort. The other denominations, Plymouth Brethren in Holtown, 1890, Pentecostals in Holtown, 1904. Um, Seventh-day Adventists came to the parish around 1900, but they never got their first chapel built until 1926. Salvation Army came in 1930, the Jehovah Witnesses about the same time. St. Francis of Assisi came in 1958 and uh, consecrated what was another fort. Um, George's Battery um, and turned that into St. Francis of Assisi. So let's look then at the Quakers in St. Peter. The name Scantlebury, 1912. Philip Scantlebury comes back to Barbados and he decides he's going to start preaching. And he's preaching at his mother's place under a tamarind tree open air. And from there, the movement of the Church of God Reformation spread into Bridgetown at the reef and then back to the country districts. And you here at Garden uh, were one of the first of the outreach in the country districts. The Church of God Reformation movement in Barbados actually started in mile and a quarter in St. Peter. In the year 1912, there was a gentleman, Barbadian, who had migrated to the United States, and he was here to visit an ailing relative. His name was Philip Scantlebury, and the movement started with him doing open-air meetings under a tamarind tree in mile and a quarter in St. Peter. Um, now, within a, a, a few years, um, nine years to be exact, then we, we would have had by then the churches at Malina Quarter, Spitestown, the Garden, where we are now, and Greens started. And then um, and Chapman Street also in St. Michael's. So there were five churches that would have been um, started in our movement by the year 1921. Um, this was a very interesting year because it was in this year that um, a missionary called um, Brookover 
that was his name, he came here and he started doing some um, services at the bottom of Crick Hill. And it was one of those nights when he was doing these services, um, you know, that um, persons would come out to assist him with the services and nobody came out. Um, so James Duglin, who was a member at the time of the Christian Mission Church, came over and nobody was there and so he took the service. And, and the rest was history. <laughs> um, he then worked with um, Brokover, the missionary, and um, you know, they, they set about looking at how we could establish a church in this area. Um, and Brother Douglin became the first pastor of the church and he pastored for 25 years. Um, that, that period including, included the purchase of the land where the first um, sanctuary was established um, which was on the main road, um, right there in the garden, um, at the, um, close to the bottom of the gap where we are right now. Um, so he, he became the first pastor from 1922 to 1947. Um, he was succeeded by Reverend Easton Burnham, who passed from 1947 to 1969. Um, then Reverend Dr. Victor Babb, 1970 to 1985. The Reverend G. Yvonne Babb is a retired primary school principal. Her story will be part of another series. Interestingly enough, she knew the late Pastor Bob very well. One of the best of men. <laughs> we were married for 53 years and seven months when he passed. We met in church. He was a member of the Chapman Street Church of God. And at youth camps and different youth activities, we interacted. And then we fell in love. And from there it went on. We were married in 1961. So we had, in my view, and I think in his too, a very good marriage. I have said that I will grieve him, not in actual tears, but I will grieve him until the day we meet again. I look forward to resurrection. I do. He came up in the Church, in the church of God Reformation Movement because his aunt, Mrs. Ianthi Standard, they were Church of God. And he was attending Combermere School in those days, you know, transportation wasn't easy and so on. So his family lived in Spice Stone. So he went to live with her because it was easy, he was easily able to get to Combermere School where he went to school. So that's how he became Church of God, but his family, they were really Methodists, but he grew up there. And he held lots of different offices in the church as a young person. And then after his aunt fell ill, I went to live with her son who was a doctor at Six Cross Rose Clinic. He went back home and then that's how he came back down to Spike Stone. So, the church at Garden, you know, he would attend church with me from time to time. And the church needed a pastor. And he was invited to apply. So, in fact, as a matter of fact, they asked both of us. And I said, well, yes, I have always been very attractive to the ministry in the church. And I would help him. I would help him do whatever was to be done, and that's how we got into that. But we came up in the youth fellowship, youth camps, and you know all these different activities that young people can engage in. We were a part of that. So we got married then, and he was invited to pass to the church at Gardens. We, we were invited to pass to the church, which we did in 1970 when the church was rebuilt because we, we served in a, what we call a little church down on the main road, but there was no 
more room for expansion. So we had to look for a new site, which we did. And in 1970, he took up the past right there. Well, first of all, um, as I said, there was no room for expansion down the road. And we had to buy, first of all, a plot of land. We wanted somewhere away from the main road because it could be very distracting. You know, all the traffic passing, and at, at that time, traffic was increasing. So we got that lot of land in where the church is now, Reed Road, and we decided that we were going to build there. Of course, we had many church projects going that we would get the funding and so on, and the church were all behind us and so. So in 1970, the church was dedicated there where it is now. We had a vision, and, and I suppose it was Victor's vision, much more so than mine, that the church was too focused on just the spiritual aspect. And of course, we all know that we are not only spirit, we are more than spirit. So as, as set out in the scriptures concerning the ministry of Jesus, it was what we call holistic ministry not only feeding the spirit, feeding the body, the intellect, the emotions, and all that. And that is what he felt should be happening. So we saw a need in the community for a daycare center for the children. But of course, we could not fund it on our own. And I suppose it was really fueled by the fact that Victor was a member of the Child Court Care Board at the time, the National Child Care Board. He was a member there, and then he was the Justice of the Peace and all those things. And the nursery was open with help from the Caribbean Conference of Churches, and we had help from overseas as well. So we were able to open the church, and with a, a stipend from the General Assembly of the Church of God, and the parents paid what I don't recall what they paid. I was the first chairperson of the of the board, but I can't remember what money they paid. But they paid some money, and we had a good program going there. It was started and it was carried on at the back of the church, one of the first churches. It made an impact on the community. Um, they had a doctor. We had a retired nurse, we had a health worker. Those people made up the board at that time. And it, the impact on it was so great in the community that when children left here, and going like to say St. Albans or thing, they would say, um, from the Church of God, these are well taught. I have no problem in taking them. And then you find that when persons, when they, they had a training, they sent the children too, to the nursery. Well, it is not as strong now, because we had to make some changes because, you know, the government, the nursery is there. And the fee was very nominal. It came to be as a ministry and a service to the community. So it was never that. If you don't have, you can't bring your children. If you think, it was done as part of the evangelistic um, of the church of the church. A fine example of a church going outside of its four walls, serving and embracing its community. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for staying with us. We look forward to having you again next week at the same time. Goodbye.